Hi, thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Adrian from Torrentia and uh, it's great to have this opportunity to speak to all of you from, from where, wherever you are. Amazing that so many people in so many countries. Um, so let's get this going. So I want to offer some strategic thoughts today about moving from the systems that we've grown used to, to, to the new world of, of, of cloud services. Obviously, as we all know, COVID is as catapulted as, in, as into the future and, and the necessity to innovate has become more critical than ever. Um, so you know, museums are clearly looking to find new ways to connect with the public and to accommodate remote working and generate new income streams. But we need to do that from where we are. But the question is, are we ready for it? So many organizations have, have struggled with, with legacy systems. Um, and, and you know, from my uh, experience as a consultant, uh, there have been a number of questions that have been, been, been asked to me in, in recent briefs. Um, is there something better that we should be using? I bought my systems you know, over, over 10 years ago. How can we avoid inefficient uh, management and duplication of effort? And there's a need for a more joined up and agile approach. Are the changes that we can make to develop cross departmental working? Can you, can you review and recommend more efficient, robust and sustainable methods to integrate collections data? And we've all benefited from the work of the, the Knight Foundation and there have been two, uh, two recent uh, very good reports. And they, the, the first one, the digital readiness and innovation in museums one in particular, which was carried out just before COVID uh, back, back in March, uh, a survey of 480 uh, um, American museums uh, gives a great snapshot of, of digital readiness. The key findings focus on strategy and, and digital practice. And it's interesting to, to note of the museum surveyed, only 25% of them said that they either had a strategy or some, some form of organizational plan. In terms of integrations between, between key systems, 49% um, said that they had no uh, intentional integrations and only 1% recorded the fact that they thought the integrations they had were fluid. Um, in, and then in terms of sort of digital, pra digital practice and project management, a staggering 69% of organizations said that they didn't follow anything that, that was formal. Um, and, and in terms of an approach to projects, it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't necessarily user centric. And only 11% of museums admitted to defining their goals um, up front. So in, some interesting, uh, interesting stats in terms of where, where those museums felt they, they, they were at the time. And one of the things that stood out for me in this report was, the, was this wonderful phrase that organizations need to develop muscle and mindset for the digital transformation journey. Um, and so I've been thinking um, about that. And, and, it, and, and you know, it's, so it's clear that for some, there is a big gap between the current reality and, and the desired transformation. Um, and successful innovation requires a mature mindset to understand where you want to go. Um, and, and how you bring people, culture and technology together to deliver that required transformation because it's not just about technology. So how do we go about developing this muscle and, mind, and mindset? I think it's about how, how we start to think differently. And you know, technology is clearly the enabler for digital innovation um, and, and technology has changed. And so we need to have some better understanding of, of, of what we now tend to call digital ecosystems. Uh, but we also need to think about users and having a, a user-centric approach or mindset. Um, and as well as that, I think focusing on specific problems rather than trying to do everything, understand, you know, having a better understanding of, of perhaps some priority, priorities, what you want to achieve and setting some goals is clearly um, uh, part of that. So what, what do I mean by digital ecosystem? Um, well, I think that, that an, an ecosystem to support innovation is very different 
to the sort of legacy infrastructure that's in place in, in many, many museums and, and other organizations you know, outside the, se the sector. And so I think we tend to think of something that's essentially digital if it's, if it's connected, scalable, collaborative, agile and contextualized. And I think uh, um, bearing those, those, uh, those words in mind, I think is important as we go through this, particularly things like connected, scalable, agile um, and, and contextualized. You know, is, it, is it happening you know, uh, from, from at home or, or you're at the museum? Is it before or after a visit? Those kinds of, those kinds of things that I mean by contextualized. And then in terms of the kind of the user centric or, or, or problem solving approach, um, I've been thinking about this and I wanted to focus perhaps on how, how the development of what I'm calling a service based mindset and culture um, offers potentially a more holistic approach to, to developing strategy and building connected processes and, and, and perhaps offering more targeted ways towards these innovative solutions that we all desire. So what, so what is a service? Um, a service you could say is everything you need to solve a particular problem uh, or it's, it's a connected set of, of, of processes and those connected processes work at, very, at a number of different levels. So at an organisational level um, it's about getting something done, you know, beginning to end, start to finish and, it's that, and so that's not just about the technology, it's also about the, 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 the people and the communications and the context. So um, so kind of a generic example might be, for example, uh, a supermarket who's providing a service to let customers order their groceries online, or um, a government-based service to let me renew my passport or pay my tax. So those are, uh, you know, in developing those services, the, the, the organizations have had to think about how do they combine data that's traditionally held in separate systems and databases to support the process for customers, uh, internal users within those organizations and any, and any third parties that might be involved in, in, in delivering the service uh, as, as a whole. And some, some examples of that uh, in a, in, for, from, from museums, for example, might be getting your collections data online and a, a service that re reliably and robustly and efficiently delivers that you know, in, a, in, a, in a continuous and, and ongoing way. Or it might be a service that's, that's sharing your content with DPLA or, or Art Store or Europe, Europeana or, or something like that. That, 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 that. Again, that keeps that that going and regular. Or you know, a print-on-demand image service like or, or something like Zazzle, uh, and, and finding a way in which you can you can handle the the the, the image selection, image transformations, the, the the rights and licensing, and the delivery of that content to to whoever you're partnering with. And similarly, more increasingly with video on demand. Uh, uh, trying, trying to actually deliver that content to, to a third party in, 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 with any frequency and, and scale. Uh, or it could, in, could be something like a crowdsourcing project uh, where, you're, where you're wanting to connect to, to, to and engage an external uh, group of, of, uh, of, of people uh, and uh, ask them to do something, contribute some content, um, and then process that content uh, in, in the organisations so it's outside in rather than, than inside out. And then there's also nicely a concept of, of services at the application, uh, application level. Um, and, and these uh, so-called microservices are what I want to, to focus on now. And so as, as organizations begin to comprehend the limitations, inflexibility and lack of connectivity of their legacy systems where change is hard or slow, um, expensive, a better understanding of modern software architecture is going to be very useful. So, as I said earlier, <laughs> of course, you know, technology has changed. And I think we can better understand the growth of these microservices through considering problems with what, what are known as legacy systems models. And legacy systems, of course, are not necessarily defined by age. Um, it could be that it's, it's considered legacy if it doesn't meet the needs of the business anymore, or if the software becomes difficult to improve, maintain, improve, or integrate uh, with, with other systems. And legacy systems tend to be uh, tend to be called monolithic because everything's in one place. So it's one giant database, uh, a single interface, a single database, um, and generally connected by a set of interrelated um, modules. And one of the key problems with this monolithic uh, system approach is that if something breaks, it breaks as a whole. 
um, and as an application is developed and expands over time, it becomes harder and harder to manage and maintain. So change becomes slower and more difficult. Um, so monolithic systems are complex and often inflexible. And, and you know, very often, as we know, there, there are no APIs so connecting to these systems uh, becomes, becomes uh, very, very hard. And of course, that, that, that situation with the, 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 the single monolithic system is, is exacerbated through, of course, well, that's repeated throughout the, the entire organization. And, and of course, it's not, not uncommon to have many of these, these different systems uh, that, that, that each, each have their own particular function and, and purpose in, in, the, in the organization uh, traditionally. Uh, but of course, it's, it's, they don't necessarily support entire workflows or processes across, across the organization. So you know, here's an example from, from uh, our, our partner, the, the Computer History Museum, uh, and it shows their, their current um, architecture. And I'm sure many of you will, will be familiar with, it, with, with this, this, this similar uh, layout, and that, that's very uh, typical. Microservices, um, on the other hand, um, is, is, a, is an architecture for, for building modern applications. And the overall application is made up from a set of loosely coupled components or, or microservices where each microservice represents a component that can be created and, and, and maintained separately. Um, and each microservice is responsible for something specific. Um, and these individual services communi communicate with each, with each other using APIs. So you can then connect microservices together, build an interface on top of that to do something specific. So that might be, say, exhibition management. So uh, a range of services that are that are joined together to enable uh, enable you to to do something very specific around your exhibition management needs, or it could be transport and, and shipping. So you'll see here that just by adding in an extra service, uh, I'm, I'm connecting to existing services uh, and building a new interface rather than actually building an entirely separate uh, vertical um, stack. Similarly here with, with, with conservation management. So, so it's, it's possible to, to uh, extend, this, extend the microservices and join these together uh, as, as you need to create interfaces to support the, the, the kind of micro, macro services um, as, as, you need, as you need to do that. Um, and again, here, another slide uh, from the Computer History Museum showing how their, their you know, diagram of their new technology strategy with a clear shift from that sort of vertical silo stack approach to a more layered horizontal and integrated digital ecosystem that's made up of a number of, of layers uh, supporting open standards with, with, with APIs to understand how that, that architecture is able to deliver these audience experiences. So, so microservices then are a way to provide the kind of digital ecosystem to support the innovation that we need. A microservices approach will help you be more agile and flexible. It's easier to make changes. Um, and a component-based approach is more resilient to, on, to, to this ongoing change uh, and, and also easier to, to scale. On top of that, user experiences, as we've seen, because you can build uh, um, inter interfaces um, on top, it's better to, it's easier, it becomes easier to orchestrate data and, and to build interfaces that can, can work on multiple different platforms and devices to support the specific task or service uh, that, that, that you need. So how do we go about making the transition from, from where we are now, from the, from the legacy systems that we have now to the modern uh, um, service-based di digital platform? Um, so we know from experience and, and backed up by the, the, the recent Knight Foundation reports that digital strategy planning and development of requirements for new technologies is, is often departmentally led. Uh, and it's tempting, of course, with a, with a legacy refresh program to, to start by wanting to recreate the current system. Um, but rather than, rather than thinking about this in terms of systems, can we use some of this organizational level muscle uh, and microservices mindset uh, to, to think differently, um, and can we bridge uh, bridge the gap or mind the gap, as we say in the UK, um, allowing organisations to continue to manage data in their legacy systems as well as making data available to a modern cloud services. Where where do we start? Um, so I think I think there are sort of 
five key points I want to make here. Um, and I'll talk about those in a bit more detail. So that's what I call con connect and collect, developing an API, identifying a service, experimenting, and, and progressively enhancing. In terms of connect and collect, um, I think connecting your legacy data to a modern cloud infrastructure is, is, the, is the sort of key nut to crack. And, and, and historically, I think there have been, there have been a, lot of, uh, a lot, of, lot of techniques and approaches to, to, to do this that different museums have, have taken. And of course, the approach depends on the resources that you've, that you've had available, you know, what budget you've got, the access to developers and, and, and skills, et cetera. And um, you know, so sometimes these, these, these approaches have had to be piecemeal because of lack, you know, lack of or limited budget, um, where, they're, they're, where, the, where the problem is tackled from a, from a project by project um, perspective. Um, in other cases, it's, they, they, of course, it's been more, more, uh, more strategic. Uh, but I think, uh, I think we'll see uh, going forward as, as, uh, as these legacy systems, of course, by, by year get older and older, it's going to be becoming in increasingly more, uh, more the norm to, to have some form of more kind of um, strategic approach to, to this to support what, what I would call data harvesting um, at, at scale. And, and, um, and once we have some form of, of harvesting service that, that can reliably pull data from a legacy, legacy source into a cloud-based uh, store, um, and, and, and which, which acts as a repository, uh, that, that can then be the beginning of your, of your journey. So in, in this case, uh, users can continue to, to use the legacy system, and we have a reliable, reliable and robust way of taking an agreed set of that data and pushing that into the cloud for, for uh, extended use uh, um, and, and, and elsewhere in the organization. So the next thing, once you've got your, your, your data harvesting service and pushed your, your, your data into a cloud store, is, is, is you need to develop a, uh, an API to that. So you need to provide controlled access to, uh, to, to that data. Uh, the nature of the API, of course, ultimately will grow and be shaped by the kinds of, of services and, and interactions you want um, with the data. And, and, um, and, and of course, it's true that, that quite a lot of larger organizations have managed to build bespoke APIs to their, uh, to their legacy legacy systems um, and, and others have built kind of bespoke uh, pipelines and using things like Elasticsearch to push push the content into but of course I'm, I'm conscious that there are many many museums that just simply haven't had the budget uh, to be able to to uh, to do that that kind of thing and again so so that so that uh, an, an approach uh, and, and a productizing of that uh, as, a, as a set uh, is something that we're likely to see uh, moving moving forward. Um, and so once you have the once you have the API, then you can start to think about well, what services do I want to create? And and I'm I'm just using a simple illustration here to imagine that combined with the cl the collection API, um, I'm building an overall service that perhaps might deliver uh, content to to third parties. Uh, and to do that, I might need to have some transformation of the data, um, you know, I, you know, whether basic transformation or, or more enhanced using some sort of machine uh, learning service that might add tags or make connections to things like Wikidata or linked open data. It might process the images and, and prepare those for uh, in, in a triple IF format. And, and on top of that, uh, handle the, the rights and licensing of the, the combined asset and, and uh, object um, data. Um, so it depends on what your priorities are, what you, um, what you, what you want to do. But the, but the idea is that, that, you know, think about the outcome uh, rather than thinking about uh, the system um, itself. And so, so this, this approach is one that is very much based on, on iteration and, and what we call progressive enhancement, you know, building up the, the capabilities of the and features um, uh, and services um, over time. And, that, and, and that's more suited to making the kind of essential organizational change uh, that, that's needed around this to support it. So the new ways of working, the, 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 the thinking about audiences and, and, and gathering feedback uh, and incorporating that, that user testing, et cetera. Um, and, and an approach like this uh, has built in openness and, and extensibility. You're not, you're not you know, doing something as a one-off or, or, or fixing. Anything you do can be extended through the, through the next, next service or, or next, uh, next kind of strategic project um, that, that you have. So establishing a service-oriented mindset allows museums to then rethink their approach to budget and the procurement of new technologies. Um, 
as of course, you know, uh, if we think about it, legacy systems required capital investment uh, for licenses and hardware. In turn, this meant, you know, it's worth spending a lot of time thinking about what you want, not just for now, but maybe for a long time, uh, creating those, that long list of functional requ requirements. But uh, you don't need to do that if you take a, a, a cloud-based approach where your, where, where the, the, the cost is very much operational. Uh, it's, 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 it's a service and you pay on a per month or a per, a per year basis. So there's no capital outlay and no, no, uh, no hardware investment. So that makes it easier for organizations to get started, to experiment, to discover what works and then, and then, uh, and then iterate. So just lastly, um, you know, uh, just a couple of, of you know, uh, of, of slides of examples of, 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 of services that you, that, 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 that might be uh, the kinds of things that you might want to do um, and, and some more, more technically oriented services um, here. So I think my time is coming up. I've got to my last slide um, and uh, thank you for, thank you for listening and, and watching and uh, see you soon. Thanks. Bye-bye.